When conservative MP Stephen Fletcher was left a quadriplegic after a car crash with a moose, doctors told him that he would be institutionalized for life. It's proof of his resiliency and humor that Fletcher later quipped, I don't think that the doctors thought the institution would be Parliament. Coming up right now, Canada's first quadriplegic MP, Stephen Fletcher, talks about life beyond politics. Stephen Fletcher, thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to Beyond Politics. Thank you very much, Catherine. So, you were not only not born in Canada, you were born way far away. You were born in Rio de Janeiro. That's right. I, uh, my father was working as an engineer uh, in uh, Brazil, and I, uh, for whatever reason, uh, became a product of uh, the Brazilian culture. And uh, yeah, I was born there. I lived there for five years. I went to kindergarten in in Rio de Janeiro and uh, moved back when I was five. Fluently port, uh, fluent in Portuguese and uh, quickly forgot it, unfortunately. You did. I, it is yeah. too bad. I mean, I know naturally if you're a five-year-old child and you're not exposed anymore to that language that you probably don't keep it up as easily, but it, it would be nice. It's almost sad to know that at one point you were fluent in a language and yeah. now it's gone. I have the utmost respect for those who know one or more, uh, or one, two or more languages. Yeah. And... Uh, it is definitely a life asset, which uh, I lost at five, <laughs> but uh, say la vie. <laughs> Tell me about life in Rio. Do you actually have memories of it? Well, I'm not sure uh, I can tell you all my memories uh, because there, I do remember the women on Copacabana Beach. Yeah, that's probably a pretty searing memory for yes, a little boy. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I do uh, recall going to school. I remember the sugar loaf and being on the beach and... Uh, you know, just little trinkets around the apartment uh, where we lived and, and so on. But uh, I was fortunate to go back a couple years ago. Uh, there was a public health conference in, in my role as Parliamentary Secretary for Health. And I actually was, oh yeah, I remember that. Is and, that uh, so? And, and I thought that was kind of cool. And uh, I, uh, I'm very gr grateful to have been born in uh, another country, uh, particularly a de developing country, because even growing up, you always have that with you, that there are other places in the world, and that compared to Canada, the vast majority of the places um, have a lot of work to do, and we're very, very fortunate to live in Canada. Yeah. When you got back to Canada, was it a tough adjustment? I, my parents uh, say it, it wasn't really. I can, uh, you know, snow was a big deal. Yeah, uh, I bet. <laughs> I can remember going to uh, school and working on the th sound uh, because uh, the th sound doesn't exist in Portuguese. So I was saying da, der, da. So I and practicing some of the other sounds that are unique to English. So I, I think that's the legacy of being from Brazil that I recall the, the most in the can on the Canada side. Of Did the, kids tease you for that? Do you remember that or was everyone pretty cool about it? I, 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 I don't uh, I don't think uh, kids, uh, no, I th I th we're all just You're all learning, learning to talk yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, if I, you know, it just it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you like as a little boy? Well, it depends uh, who you ask. I think um, my my mom and dad uh, may have said I may not have been the most uh, uh, well-behaved child, uh, but uh, you know we all grow to that stage eventually, and, uh, and I think I did that and and uh, and went on to other things. You have siblings. Yes. You have a, a brother and a sister. Yeah, I have a brother who was also born in Rio de Janeiro. And a sister. So before you or after you? After. He's four years younger. Uh -huh. And a sister who was born in Winnipeg, and she's seven years younger than I am. Okay, so you're the oldest. Yes. All right. Yeah, hence all the responsibility. Of course. And Mama, I have to tell you, my younger siblings get away with murder compared to, uh, you know, when I 
was growing. That doesn't seem fair. It's not, life is not fair. No, but they owe you big. They do, and so. I'm still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and were you a politically active little kid? I wouldn't say a politically active little kid, but I did get involved in in student uh, affairs in, in high school. Yeah. I, in grade 12, I was president of the student council, and uh, moving into uh, university, I was involved in the engineering society because I took engineering. Um, and I was also very involved with um, organizations like the Manitoba Natural Society, Manitoba Recreational Canoeing Association. I was very much an avid uh, wilderness canoeist mm -hmm. and uh, loved going out into the Canadian wilderness in eastern Manitoba and northwestern Ontario. And uh, that was really where my passion lay in high school and in university was the Canadian outdoors. And you were a kayaker too, weren't you? Yes, I competed uh, in kayaking, the K1, K2, K4 events, and those who are familiar with Olympic style kayaking, and um, was provincial kayak champ for a couple years and went to Canada Games and competed nationally and had that experience, which is, is uh, I'm also very grateful to have had that opportunity. And, um, and especially in a sport that is so Canadian. Sure. And uh, it is um, a very uh, disciplined sport, and I would definitely encourage everyone to try the Olympic style kayaking because uh, you learn to uh, balance things, shall we say. Yeah, literally. Yes. Yeah. Who got you interested in that? Well, it was a. Uh, uh, I went to summer camp. Um, when I was a kid and enjoyed the wilderness canoeing yeah. and uh, there was a kayak uh, canoe club in Winnipeg so that seemed like the natural thing to go to uh, while I was in the city and found out I was pretty good at it and yeah. uh, stuck with it for a few years until uh, university studies uh, took over. Let's talk a little bit about university too because you come from a long line of engineers and you yourself decided to study engineering too. Yeah it's interesting I um, uh, my dad is an engineer well my both my siblings are engineers my dad is an engineer his dad is an engineer and his dad was an engineer so we're fourth generation and family research um, from New Zealand actually uh, revealed that uh, there's a Colonel McKellar who was an engineer with General Wolf. Oh my and, gosh. And I'm a direct descendant of this fellow. Is it just your genetics, do you think, I, that make you into engineers? I, 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 don't, I don't know, but uh, once an engineer, you're always an engineer. And uh, uh, we were quite surprised to be able to trace it back right to 1759. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but um, uh, I think engineering, uh, it is a different way of looking at the world if you get through the entire program. There aren't a lot of engineers in, in Parliament because, you know, engineers tend to do other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's what I would have done if there wasn't a, a major event in my life that caused me to be in a, in a wheelchair. But uh, an engineering education, I, um, I think, is probably one of the... Um, best things that I did uh, before my accident and certainly provided me with the tools to adapt to new circumstances. How so? I learned how to learn uh, and learn differently than I learned uh, before during my time as an engineer and it's tough and so after my accident I had to relearn how to learn uh, in order to do my MBA and uh, when you can't turn a page in a book or write down a number or even a letter, um, you have to approach uh, the challenges in a different way. And I think the engineering education allowed me to figure out the path to take in order to successfully complete an MBA paralyzed completely from the neck down. Was there pressure on you to become an engineer because it was a family uh, tradition? No, and none at all. Really? No, and none okay. on my siblings we just y'all just our, naturally fell into that yeah well our, our father um, uh, my both my parents are just 
amazing people. My father, um, having been an engineer, I think um, we all uh, would like to just be like our dad. And my mom, my sister would like to be like my mom. Um, but uh, um, I think if we can, we all feel that if we could just be uh, uh, the fraction, the father uh, to our kids as my father has been to us, we would all consider ourselves very successful. And part of that is to be able to provide and teach your offspring. And engineering uh, seems to be a good career path that uh, enriches not only the li your, your own life, but the lives of the people around you. Yeah. Now, um, you, talked, you talked a little bit about your accident, and uh, most Canadians know you as the first quadriplegic MP to sit in the House of Commons, but a lot of people don't know what caused you to become a quadriplegic. Can you tell us a little bit about the collision? Sure. I uh, was working in the mining industry after my, my accident. I had a short stint with AECL and, uh, in Pinawa, and then uh, worked at the Bissette Gold Mine in, on the east side of Lake Winnipeg. And I was driving to work one day, uh, early in the morning, in January 11th, 1996, and uh, I hit a moose with my car. The moose went through the windshield, landed in the back seat. The car went into the ditch, and the moose flew over the car again, and, and me. And um, I was in uh, the ditch for, I know they estimated around 45 minutes before anyone found me, and then it was a long time before they could get an ambulance because we were in the middle of nowhere. And um, I was left a C4 quadriplegic, so I am completely paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, so that means that I can't feel anything below the neck. I can't move anything below the neck. I don't feel pain or uh, pleasure below the neck. I, I don't sweat or perspire it, it, or shiver. My head is completely disconnected from my body in a neurological sense. So it is a, a very uh, traumatic in in injury and um, and it was um, during this time that uh, uh, I realized um, that on one hand we save people from catastrophe but all too often we don't allow those same people the opportunity to live meaningful and dignified lives. Mm -hmm. I was told that if I were to live, that would be likely in an institution. And when you're 23, um, you don't want, that's not just not what you want to hear. And uh, I had to fight very hard to live in the community independently, uh, fight the insurance company, fight the, the system, and, um, and I was able uh, to do that by the skin of my teeth, and it's you know resources are always very difficult to come across. And accessible housing, accessible transportation, these are all uh, very difficult to uh, to obtain, and um, that is when I became politically active. I would say in a in a public policy way, I began to advocate for myself. I saw that other people were benefiting for my advocacy as well, and, um, and move forward. And the other thing that uh, I realized, and this was very difficult to accept, but my canoeing days were over. Mm. My mining days are over. There aren't too many wheelchair accessible mines, and that I had to re-educate myself. So I decided to do what I was going to do before the accident, and that was to do my MBA. and. Uh, uh, didn't have a clue on how that was going to work, but I wrote the GMAT, uh, and even though I was told that probably I wouldn't be able to write it, uh, and they weren't able to accommodate all the things that I needed, um, I still wrote it and, and did well in the GMAT, and, and was accepted to the MBA program at the University of Manitoba. And, uh, and then... And you haven't looked back since. Well, I've looked back to a few times and wondering uh, hmm. what... what uh, you know, it's tough not to look back, but, uh, but you always have to look forward, otherwise uh, looking back is, 
is uh, the path to darkness, shall we say. When you were, um, you said that it took 45 minutes for anyone to find you and that um, you had mentioned that you were, uh, before the interview, that uh, it was purely luck that someone came upon your vehicle. Were you conscious? I, I remember being in the vehicle and, and uh, just feeling the, the air against my face and it was a very unique day in January. It was a very cold winter, but that particular day it was around freezing. And, um, and I do remember the people coming and asking if I was all right and saying, I don't think so. And, um, and they kept me warm and, uh, until they could uh, uh, get help, professional help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was uh, once I got to the hospital. I was I was able to talk, but the conditions soon deteriorated. I, uh, my lungs collapsed. I was intubated, so I couldn't speak. And for many months, I could only communicate through a wink or a tick noise. Um, and um, and at a time that I had a lot of questions about what was happening, I wasn't able to answer, to ask them. And uh, of course, it's difficult for my family. They don't know if I had brain damage. Um, it, you know, they, you know, it was just a really devastating uh, event for everyone. It must also have been um, unequivocally the scariest situation to ever go through to not be able to communicate. Yeah, it, it, I can't explain it. I it is it is very, um, very very scary, it's particularly when you have all sorts of medical issues like I. I remember there was many times where I thought I was going to drown in my own phlegm and unable to get help. Uh, it, it, um, it was just nothing can ever be thrown at me, I think, that could ever compare to uh, uh, that first year in the hospital. You really did make a pretty determined decision that if you were going to survive this, that you were going to live on your own terms. Did your family help you to do that? I mean, was you must have had someone there saying, yeah, we're with you, we agree with you, we'll fight with you. Or were you entirely on your own during this fight? No, my family was uh, very much involved in the advocacy and helping me secure the resources uh, from the insurance company and, and the province and so on to, to at least make a go of it. Though they were never involved in my personal care, uh, which was another rule I had for myself. Um, Can I ask why? Because um, it's personal. Like I, they're my family. They're my mom and dad. Um, and my, my, brother and, my brother was just 20-ish and my sister was still in high school. I, I, you know, I just felt that it would change our relationship, and um, I wanted to be a, a son, um, not a, a burden. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be wrong on that. Um, and though you make those evaluations, you think, you know, um, are am I going to be a burden? You know, and, and what impact does I have on my family? And so it was basically, you know, three choices: to to die. Uh, to live in misery or to fight and after careful consideration of the three um, decided on the latter um, but it was very difficult absolutely you have essentially been fighting in a positive way ever since I mean you um, you fought to finish your MBA and you then became um, very much involved, and at the same time, you became very much involved in um, student politics. And then you got active in, in other politics as well, on a higher level, and now you're a sitting member of parliament. When you were first asked if you would decide to run, if you'd choose to run, what was your initial reaction? Well, it, I ran with my brother in a slate for um, so at the University of Manitoba Student Union president. And we weren't sure uh, if we were going to be able to pull it off, but we approached it as engineers and <laughs> and uh, segmented the university and uh, decided where the strategic locations were for the first signage and and uh, organized teams of volunteers and thank goodness uh, 
engineers tend to stick together, so we have a lot of support from the engineering faculties and the other professional faculties. And um, and we were able to uh, win in a very tight race. And of course, the issue of the wheelchair, I, I think, came up uh, quite a bit. Uh, but Why? Interest, Why would it come up? Well, you know, does Fletcher have the energy to to uh, to do it? Can how can he travel? You know, all these these questions. Okay. And um, though I the students um, uh, at the University of Manitoba paid me, I think, the ultimate compliment the second time I ran for Amsu president, in that they were challenging me on my policies because after all I was a conservative in a left of center environment running for a second term and uh, we were able to pay off the student uh, debt and increase funding to student groups and uh, change the, the governance of the student union but uh, it was uh, you know certainly uh, controversial and I think that controversy and, and student politics some people say it's the worst kind of politics and I, I kind of have to agree um, on, on several levels and, and that was a really the positive training ground. Now the first time I was asked to run federally was in the year 2000 while I was still president of the University of Manitoba Students Union and it was by a guy named Joe Clark <laughs> and uh, uh, Mr. Clark and I met uh, in Ottawa during a, a convention in um, during a Canadian Alliance of Student Association convention, I met him in his office, and I was kind of uh, awestruck because I, the first time I had met him, and uh, um, we had talked about the possibility of me running in the Ryan now represent, and um, but I was focused on provincial politics at the time, and I politely uh, said I don't think it's going to work out this time. Um, then I ran for the nomination in Tuxedo which was Gary Philman's old uh, riding when uh, unfortunately he, he lost um, the premiership uh, but I lost that nomination uh, and then uh, I talked to, your, uh, to Mr. Clark again and uh, uh, but the timing uh, just wasn't there so um, but uh, the following year I ran for president of the uh, Progressive Conservative Party of Manitoba uh, and was successful and I was, had completed my MBA by this time ran again and I was got very involved in the Unite the Right movement and I was very impressed with uh, Stephen Harper and ran um, for the Canadian Alliance nomination in Charles with St. James Assiniboia with the as you know while well, I was president of the PC party in Manitoba with the intent of uniting the vote um, but thankfully uh, at least from my perspective um, uh, the now Prime Minister and Peter McKay uh, trumped uh, that and uh, uh, brought the parties together so I had to run again for the nomination for the Conservative Party. Like this, these are all contested nominations, nothing was, you know. Exhausting. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and those who know about, well, the, the nominations are the worst uh, type of, of uh, event because you're fighting amongst yeah. your own. And um, anyway, it was successful and, uh, and I thought it was a pretty, pretty, uh, Things look good, and then uh, a guy named Glenn Murray announced that he was going to run in in the riding. Uh, popular, very popular, mm -hmm. very 100% name recognition, former mayor of Winnipeg, and and uh, so. Uh, did you basically at that point see your campaign in your eyes go up in smoke, or did you think, no, we can do this? No, I thought, no, we can do this, and I had a, a fabulous volunteer base, and um, we were uh, absolutely focused on on the riding. Uh, uh, Glenn Murray, uh, I have to say, attracted a huge amount of media uh, right across the country. Um, but I focused on the on the riding and, and making sure I got the lawn signs up and door, door knocked on as many doors as, as possible. And um, on the election night, by 734 votes, uh, was successful. And uh, um, it was very... Um, very humbled by that. Is it what you expected now that you're in Ottawa and you've been here for a few years? Is being an MP what you hoped it would be? In a, in a lot of ways, yes. Uh, um, and, and then some. I was fortunate, uh, again, that the uh, leader of the opposition after my first election, Stephen Harper, appointed me uh, a health critic for the Conservative Party at a time when health was the, the issue. Mm -hmm. 
and and uh, something that you know a lot about personally yeah, in the healthcare industry. Unfortunately yeah. for me, but perhaps good for luckily for other Canadians yeah, too. And was able to apply a lot of those lessons to um, uh, to being a member of Parliament. Uh, we uh, worked together with Pat Martin on getting rid of trans fats. Uh, carried on the Conservative Party legacy of fighting for hepatitis C victims compensation. Uh, we, um, uh, but I th we worked on a national cancer strategy, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, a mental, national mental health uh, um, program, and a cardiovascular strategy. But I think the main thing that um, came out of that was the patient wait time guarantee. And to be just part of that um, with uh, now Prime Minister and now Health Minister was uh, it's still a surreal. If I could pinch myself, I could, I would, you know, like I, I just can't, uh, can't believe some of the things that I've seen and experienced. Do you want to stick with politics? Is it something you're enjoying enough that if the voters allow you to, you'll stick with it for the next uh, few elections at least? Or? Well, that's my plan, though I, I think the, the most prestigious title a uh, man can have is dad. And it will always be my goal to have a family of my own if it's possible. And, uh, and if that ever happened, uh, I would uh, definitely reevaluate um, my situation. But uh, right now, I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be a member of parliament. It's very humbling. Um, get to uh, affect public policy in ways I never thought I would be able to, but also help the constituents, help people with their immigration issues or EI, or just help people navigate through the healthcare system or whatever problem they're having. And, um, and it is special to be able to help other Canadians. You know, I, I, I should, I've said this before, that being a C4 quadriplegic at 23 is one of the most expensive injuries society can incur. So it is very helpful for my state of mind to be able to give back to the country, which has given me so much. But you also are, um, you're more active, I think, than so many other people would have decided to be. I mean, when you said that you had three options and that one of them was to fight, you really have fought. I mean, you, you have not stopped. And I wonder how you keep your energy up to be able to just continue to fight, whether that's on a personal level or a political level, day in and day out. What is it that keeps you going? Well, the hope for a better tomorrow, I think. Uh, I'm still in fights with Manitoba Public Insurance, and, and uh, to this day, 12 years after the accident. Uh, but um, day by day, I know, I know it's difficult to see improvements, but if... I look at where I was, you know, five years ago versus now. That's better, and certainly ten years ago versus now. It's it's unbelievable uh, to me, and um, uh, and I think the goal, as I've said, is to try and emulate the family in which I come from, and uh, I think that dream, if you like, uh, is what keeps me going. I really appreciate that you took the time to be here today. Thanks very much. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you, Catherine. It's nice to see you. Thank you. You too.